Hello. In introducing Herzog's Caspar Hauser last class, I noted that the enigma of this character, who actually existed in 19th century Germany, is manifold. Questions swirl around his parentage, why Caspar turns up in Nuremberg with a note in his hand, and who kills him. In rendering Caspar's life, Herzog offers answers to only a few of these questions, but he's much more concerned with three metaphysical mysteries that surround Caspar. First, the ontological riddle of what it means to be human. Second, the theological mystery of where consciousness originates and returns to when we die. And third, as implied in the phrase God against all in the German title, the enigma of a divine creator who permits the innocent to suffer so terribly. Caspar Hauser's sufferings are numerous. Herzog observed that Caspar's story is about what civilization does to us all, how it deforms and destroys us by bringing us into society's line. But Caspar isn't really like most of us when you think of it. He possesses a radical innocence that no amount of physical or mental suffering can corrupt or eradicate. He seems to suffer two falls. First, a fall into mortal being from a realm of spirit dimly remembered in the dreamscapes that we see at the start of the film, and second, a fall into language and reason and social awareness that mutilate Casper as severely as the brutality inflicted on him by the man in black. Both of Casper's falls are agonizing, but unlike Adam, neither fall robs him of his innocence. He is, in short, in that respect, less an Adam figure than a Christ figure, a martyr, uh, though one who is, who redeems no one ultimately by his life or his death. Rather, Casper's nobility merely exposes the mendacity and self-interest of those around him. In presenting Casper this way, Herzog faced a challenge that other filmmakers and novelists have occasionally struggled with. It's this, how to create a narrative about a totally virtuous human being who endures the evils inflicted on him without retaliation. Such individuals usually lack the conflicted psyches that create interest and drive stories. Uh, Dostoevsky, for example, wrestled with this problem in The Idiot and solved it only by revealing in Prince Mishkin uh, during his epileptic seizures darker submerged aspects to his character. Herzog overcomes the challenge, I think, in another way. By creating in Casper not a divided psyche, but rather a state of arrested desire. As he acquires an understanding of the world, Casper is in quiet resistance to it. Uh, his aspiration is to leave the body behind, to be restored to a prenatal state that he sees in his dreams. Herzog's haunting opening implies that Casper existed somewhere before these falls. Have a look. <laughs>
Well, before the critics ever critics credits ever begin, uh, we see a misty pastoral scene along a river. A man in a rowboat, seen from a high angle, a woman's face in close-up, the vegetation along the water through fog, uh, to the slow lilting sounds of German leader music. Where do these visionary images come from? From Casper, it seems. We share his dream memories before we ever see him. Looking back, we can speculate on the source of these images because he has other visions of similarly serene and beautiful places later. Perhaps this is around Casper knew before his incarceration in the realm of matter, some prior state of being, disembodied, that he dimly remembers and longs for. As Casper later remarks, quote, it seems to me that coming into the world was a very hard fall. Yet it's difficult to think of these images as deriving entirely from a prenatal state because they depict the world of nature, which Casper, of course, didn't even know existed for 16 years. The woman in these scenes is also mysterious. Perhaps she is Casper's mother and derives not from a prenatal experience, but from a remembered glimpse of her in his infancy before he was abducted. If so, the woman's appearance is paradoxical because Casper seems to associate her with the bliss of his original state before birth. Later in the film, he murmurs, Mother, I am so far away from everything. Perhaps this visionary female, then, is not his biological mother, but more a sort of spiritual mother. The shot of an actual woman washing clothes by the water brings us out of the dreamlike memory and into the diegetic present, but only briefly. We cut, then, to a field of waving grain that recalls Malick's cinematography. But the image here seems otherworldly, perhaps another image from Casper's dreams. The enigmatic epigraph that Herzog provides is taken from the playwright Georg Buchner, who would have been a contemporary of Casper's. Don't you hear that horrible screaming all around you? The screaming men you, that screaming men usually call silence. Well, what does this epigraph mean? Let me offer two possibilities. First, when Casper acquires language, the words he learns promote silent thought in his mind. And in his thoughts, Casper ponders his existence in an agonizing process that no one else can hear or share. His silent thoughts then seem to scream. A second possible reading of the epigraph concerns Casper's life in his chained isolation prior to his release, where he was deprived of language for over 16 years. Casper heard only non-linguistic sounds from outside, what most men might call silence. Yet these sounds, like the tolling of the church bell, seem to scream to Casper because he has no understanding of their source or meaning. Later, when Casper discovers how musical sounds are produced, he's deeply moved and says, music feels strong in my heart. Yet paradoxically, music is playing in Casper's visions before his birth, long before he ever knows what music is. The way field of waving grain is accompanied by Pachelbel's canon. How do we account then for these inconsistencies at the start? I don't know that we can. The ultimate origin of the images uh, and the sounds in Casper's dream memories are part of the film's enduring metaphysical mystery. Well, as the credits roll, we see Casper chained in a dark cell where we later learn he has been for 16 years shut off from the world. This is where he is dreaming from, it seems. He subsists on bread and water and scratches his raw, lice-infected legs. His one diversion is a toy horse. But having never seen a real horse, Casper can't understand the concept of a horseman. He doesn't regard the toy as a simulacrum of any animal that a man would ride. Instead, he devotes himself to wrapping the toy repeatedly carefully with his bands, as if to keep it from the cold that he feels himself in his dungeon. Amazingly, the first gesture, then, of this abused and afflicted captive seems to be one of protection. This contributes to the aura of Casper's Christ-like holiness and otherworldliness suggested by the film's opening images. Herzog reinforces this sense of Casper's spirituality with a detail in the subtitles that follow. It tells us that Casper was found on Pentecost, May 26, 1828, in the liturgical calendar, Pentecost is 50 days after Christ's resurrection on Easter and 10 days after his ascension into heaven. 
The Acts of the Apostle describe how on Pentecost a great wind blew and the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples. Flames appeared above their heads and they began speaking in strange inspired tongues. Well, these details are rich with implication. First, Casper's appearance in Nuremberg on Pentecost links him to a force of divine holiness, though unlike the apostles, the citizens of Nuremberg failed to see this holiness in him. We might recall the wind blowing also in the fields of grain in Casper's dream that seemed to link it with wind of Pentecost. Wind is also associated with another Pentecostal feature central to Herzog's film, and that is language. Language descends on Casper, as it did on the apostles, but it is rather inflicted on him than a source of inspiration. Indeed, language causes Casper pain, but so does silence. In his captivity, Casper is so unfamiliar with the outside world that he lacks not only names for things, but also a clear sense even of subject-object relations. He has used his body so little that he seems at first uncertain of where it ends and other material objects begin. He treats his belt, for example, as an extension of himself, and he identifies so intensely with a toy horse that he might not be sure that it exists as an independent entity. In this respect, his act of wrapping it from the cold might be partly an attempt not just to protect it, but a self-protective gesture. When Casper scratches his lice-bitten legs, and feet. We see that they are atrophied from lack of use, yet his keeper demands that he stand and learn to walk. But Casper's emergence requires something else first. Have a look. <laughs> named captor dressed in a black cape and hat is preparing Casper for his appearance in the world. And the first requirement is that Casper be able to write his name. Pushing a pencil into Casper's hand, the man attempts to get him to form letters through mechanical repetition without imparting any concept of the alphabet. His aim is not to teach Casper how to read or write, but rather to use language as an instrument for presenting him to the world. But he does attempt to teach Casper three words, all of them spoken and all of them thematically rich. The first word is writing, which he repeats as he moves Casper's hands across the paper. In short, the first word Casper hears is a word about the creation of words. Casper hears this word in captivity, and it's appropriate that he does because he will experience hereafter language itself as a kind of prison. He finds that words constantly refer back to other words rather than naming the transcendent place that Casper longs to return to. 
Within the closed system of language, we can only define words by using other words, and this frustrates Casper. Later, after he has learned to speak and read, Casper complains, quote, there is so much I don't know, so many words I don't understand. He needs words to think and understand, but words explain new words. Thus, he goes round and round, each word leading to new definitions. A second word he's taught here is horsey. The captor says he'll give him a horsey if he writes, but Casper already has one. The man seems to think that by presenting uh, the toy as a bribe for writing, Casper will think that he's getting something new. The horse is important because it reflects the line the captor tries to get Casper to recite about his father being a gallant rider. Now, there may or may not be truth in this claim, but uh, the name of this rider father remains unknown. The captor has given Casper a toy horse in the dubious hope that he'll grasp the concept of a rider without ever seeing a real horse. The third word the captor uses is the most important. He refers to himself as Papa. Now, in the absence of Casper's biological father, this man is the first of a series of surrogate father figures, or papas. Throughout the film, Herzog plays upon the dialectical tension between these father figures and Casper's idea of motherhood, as first suggested by the misty image of a woman's face in his opening dream. From the man in black onward, Casper associates fathers and patriarchy with his fall into language, into consciousness, into rationality, and also associates uh, fathers, uh, men, with his feelings of constriction and pain. Now, insofar as the god of this film, as suggested in the German title, uh, Every Man for Himself and God Against All, insofar as the god of this film is against his creatures, that god is also implicated in the dark aspects of fatherhood. Motherhood, by contrast, is linked in Casper's mind not with birth into the world, but rather with a prior embodied, uh, a prior disembodied state uh, before birth, glimpsed not through reason, but rather through his dreams. Casper associates the mother that he refers to with a longed-for state of freedom and contentment out of the body. Not wishing to be in the body, not wishing to be in the world at all, Casper's natural inclination is against the mechanical performance of writing that his captor demands. And after a few hand movements, he returns to his toy horse, rolling it back and forth. When the captor sees this, he punishes Casper with a blow, and certainly not the first one. Casper seems to respond impassively. He's been violently abused all along from his infancy. And yet he shows here no signs of desire to retaliate. Casper's second lesson is to stand and walk, but chained. Since his infancy, he lacks familiarity with these physical acts. In fact, Casper doesn't even understand what his legs are for. Pulling him uh, to his feet, the captor ties Casper's arms together so that he can carry him on his back to a deserted place outside. This is Casper's first exposure to light, this place where he's going to be shown how to stand and walk. The cellar, prior to this, has been his world, and now the sounds of bird song and the wind reach Casper's uncomprehending ears for the very first time. Herzog said that Casper was essentially born at the age of 16 and was thus forced to pass through all the phases of childhood in just the three years that he lived thereafter. Thus, the process of learning to stand and to walk that would take, say, a child months is now, for Casper, violently accelerated, compressed into just a day as the man in black kicks Casper's feet forward with his own. Then he attempts to teach Casper to speak just one line. Have a look. Sag mir das nach. Ich möchte ein solcher Reiter werden, wie mein Vater einer gewesen ist. Dieses Merken. Ich möchte 
ein solcher Reiter werden, wie mein Vater einer Quen ist. Reiter werden. Solcher Reiter werden, wie mein Vater. Wie mein Vater. 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 Einer Quen ist. Quen ist. Dieses Merken. Merken. Dieses Merken. to make Casper repeat the words, I want to be a gallant rider like my father was before me. He's not interested in comprehension. He just wants Casper to show an ability to parrot those words. He reiterates the phrase, like my father, like my father, and Casper repeats the word father, which has now become indelibly associated in his mind with the misery of captivity and now with the pain of learning. The man in black tells Casper to remember these words before he's even learned to pronounce them. They represent the only nominal hint of Casper's family identity. We soon discover that the statement it, he's been asked to make is related to the letter that Casper holds when he's left in the town square. It's addressed to an officer in Nuremberg, but with no explanation as to why this man has been chosen. The implication is that Casper is from a highborn family and should be adopted, therefore, by a military man of distinction who will appreci appreciate his equestrian heritage. But who arranged for Casper's disappearance, captivity, and release into the world 16 years later? Well, we never know who the man in black is taking his orders from or why. At the end of these lessons, Casper lies on the ground, inert, silent, and exhausted, with the man in black sitting perpendicular behind him. We see only his back. Herzog holds the stationary shot for nearly 20 seconds. It's a visual stillness that he repeats throughout the film and that um, Schrader would regard as a stylistic feature of transcendental style, uh, which I think to some degree Herzog shares. But here, the extended still shot seems intended less to invoke spirituality than to prompt our psychological speculation. Has the man turned away from Casper in disgust or in contempt or possibly out of guilt? Casper seems asleep as he lies on the ground, but when he opens his eyes, we cut to a subjective camera view of the lush spring landscape through Casper's eyes. We see it tilted as he does lying down. Casper has never been exposed to natural beauty before, yet the images seem somehow familiar. The misty pastoral images are reminiscent of his dreams, the tree, the valley, and above all, the waving grain. These earthly images spur Casper's longing for their unearthly counterparts in his prenatal memories. Casper's captor drags him after this to the town square where he poses him with his arms out holding two prayer books in one hand and a letter that the captor has written in the other. The man in black then scurries away, careful not to be seen. Have a look. <laughs> Was wollen Sie hier? Hof. Ja, ich habe gefragt, was Sie denn hier wollen. Wie Vater einer Quenes. 
Äh, wo wollen Sie denn hin? Sind Sie fremd hier in der Stadt? Kann ich Ihnen irgendwie behilflich sein? Vielleicht mit dem Brief da? Müssen Sie den irgendwo abgeben? Wie heißt das? An Herrn wohlgeborenen Herrn Rittmeister bei der vierten Schwadron. Beim sechsten schwulischen Regiment. Lassen Sie mal sehen. Also, das ist da vorne gleich. Nach dem Augustinergässchen um die Ecke. Da wohnt der Rittmeister. Soll ich Sie da hinbringen? Oder haben Sie was anderes vor? Jetzt sagen Sie mal, woher kommen Sie denn? Aus Ansbach, Erlangen, Regensburg. Regensburg? Aha, Regensburg, gut. Mensch, weiß davon, wo er auf? Weiß davon. Weiß davon, ja. Wo er auf? Sie dürfen ihm schon fragen, er kann es aber nicht sagen. Das Lesen und Schreiben habe ich ihm schon Gelehrte. Und wann wir ihm fragen, was er werde, so sagt er, er will auch ein solcher, ein solcher Reiter, ein solcher. Ein solcher Reiter werden. Oh, ja. oh, oh. Ein solcher Reiter werden, Reiter. was sein Vater gewesen ist. Wenn er Eltern hätte, wie er keine hatte, wäre er ein gelehrter Bursche worden. Ein gelehrter Bursche? Ein gelehrter Bursche worden, bitte, ja. Sie dürfen ihm nur was zeigen, so kann er es schon. Bester Herr Rittmeister, Sie dürfen ihm, Sie dürfen ihm gar nicht... Sie dürfen ihn. Sie dürfen ihm gar nicht traktieren. Traktieren mit G. 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 Ja, mit G. Traktieren, er weiß mein Ort nicht, wo ich bin. Ich habe ihm mitten bei der Nacht fortgeführt. Ich mache meinen Namen nicht kundbar. Und das Schrift, ja, die fehlt leider. Haben Sie ausgeschrieben, ne? Ja. Ja. Tja, merkwürdig. Na, das finde ich auch, ja. Soll ich zu Protokoll geben, dass die Unterschrift ist? Ja, bitte, und der kommt ja. in den Akten hier. Merkwürdig. Ich weiß nicht, mal. Ich weiß mal. Na, lass er das mal. Lass er das mal. Lass er das. Hey. Hey. Hey! 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 Was? Ja, Sie sehen doch, dass das alles keinen Sinn hat. Außerdem, also ich glaube, dass der nicht ganz klar im Kopf ist. Ja, jetzt kommt er, jetzt kommt er. Dein Name? Ja. Soll ich zu Protokoll gehen? Namen! Das ist die Aussage verweigert. Ja, ja. Kein Name bekannt. Woher kommt er? Kein Name. Pass! Sein Reisepass! Reiter werden. Reiter werden, ja. Gewerbe! Woher kommst du? Er hat einmal gesagt, aus Regensburg oder so. Bekannt, ich eben nicht. Ja, aus Regensburg. Dein Eid an. Die geistige Bildung dieses Menschen ist in einem Zustand der totalen Ver Here, as in other scenes, Herzog combines uh, absurdist comedy with deep pathos. As Casper stands like a statue, his isolation is heightened by the aerial shot. Um, that also diminishes his size in these unfamiliar surroundings. People look out their windows impassively at a distance, suggesting the unbridgeable gap that separates Casper from the rest of mankind. They show mild curiosity, but no compassionate interest. When a suspicious but courteous citizen confronts him, Casper blurts out the word horsey, his name for the toy uh, from which he has now been separated. He surrenders the letter addressed to the captain of the cavalry and follows the man to the captain's house. Seeing that he can scarcely stand, the doorman allows Casper to rest in the horse barn, where the captain and other prominent citizens find him later that day. They're unable to wake him. Casper longs for sleep throughout the film because it permits him to dream of that other world that he yearns for. Yet, we get not just a public reading of the captor's letter here, we also get a transcription of it as an official document, as well as a parsing of the crude style and grammar that the man in black has used. Now, underlying this linguistic comedy is the fact that Casper has entered a world into which he will be scrutinized, evaluated, and objectified through words, most viciously of all by the little scribe who observes him and writes down uh, all of the proceedings. The letter written by the man in black says that Casper was laid on him as an infant by a count, but he doesn't say who the count is, and he doesn't even say that the count is Casper's father. 
He also doesn't give his own name, nor disclose why he, a laborer with ten children, was assigned the unwelcome duty of being Casper's keeper, nor why he sequestered Casper from the outside world when the man's wife wanted to raise the infant as their own. Nor does the letter explain why now, after 16 years, Casper's captor has brought him into town and is seeking to transfer the care of Casper to the captain. The claim that he has taught Casper to read and write and that the boy wants to be a gallant writer, of course, are laughable lies. Under interrogation, Casper does write his name as he was taught in a rather elegant hand, but he is unable to say his name when asked and he shows no comprehension of what it means. Actually, Casper Hauser is not his name, but we never learn the origin of that invention nor what his real name was. Like all words, the name is merely an arbitrary sign. After Casper's appearance, the community is consumed with a desire to identify and explain him. It's agreed that he's, quote, not quite right in the head, yet they conclude that, quote, he's neither mad nor depraved. He frustrates them precisely because he eludes categories. In examining his body, the citizens of Nuremberg objectify Casper as a scientific or medical specimen. They note that his feet are bleeding from old leather boots into which they've been thrust, but he has a vaccination mark, hinting at a birth into a wealthy family. He's an enigma. Both before and after his death, Casper is, however, anatomically dissected. Uh, they examine his body when he's alive and later when he's dead. Now, the prayer books and the rosary that they find in Casper's possession puzzle them. The captor evidently intended these as a kind of moral sanitation, presenting Casper as a pious man, but they're ridiculous since Casper, of course, can't read. But Casper is being read himself, and not very successfully. The gold dust they find among his possessions is mysterious, given the captor's poverty. Is it meant as a payment for Casper's upkeep, we wonder? Or is it meant to hint at Casper's biological association with wealth and rank? Well, Casper's difference and his status as an outsider are viewed with suspicion because he frustrates the rational investigative systems that would explain him uh, and make him knowable, classifiable. It's as if Casper's existence itself, therefore, is regarded as a crime because it's mysterious, because it seems inexplicable. Thus, over the captain's objections, Casper is sent to jail with drunks and derelicts, a repetition of his original confinement in the cellar. Yet ironically, the first real human kindness Casper experiences comes when he is fed at the table of the jailkeeper and his patient, compassionate family. Have a look. Also, the salt stream. Nimm mal den Tesser. Das ist doch nichts für ihn gewesen. Gib ihm lieber Brot. Brot hat er immer angenommen. Brot. Brot. Da, nimm Brot. Gib's ihm ein Schluck Wasser. Julius. Ich mag Wasser. Das ist doch leer. Da ist doch nichts mehr drin. Kommt doch nichts mehr raus. Leer. Leer. Das ist leer. Leer. Da ist doch nichts mehr drin. Kommt nichts mehr raus. Leer. 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 Nein, der Krug ist nicht leer. Das Bier drin. Schau mal, der ist voll. Schau, das ist nicht leer. Der Krug da, der ist leer. Da ist nichts drin. Der ist leer. Leer? Ja, leer. Es wird Zeit kosten, ihn an sowas zu gewöhnen. Ich 
Reifen. Tut nie der Ramsmehrheit. Mm. Finger, Daumen, Arm. Das hier ist die Hand, das hier ist der Arm. Arm, Arm. Nase, Mund. Guck mal, hier hast du auch ein Ohr. Guck mal, ich habe sogar einen Spiegel. Das hier ist das Ohr. Ja, meine Ranze, meine Ranze. Der mich nicht schaffen. Schulter. Arm. Nein, das hier ist die Hand, das hier ist der Arm. Hand, Hand. Das hier ist der Arm. Arm, 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 Arm. Arm, Arm. Hand. Ja, da riecht ja gar Arm. nichts bei einem Bunder Wetter. Was ist denn da los? Mir. Hey! Finger. Du wirst sie fix alle Wir haben es denn da? Jetzt nichts zu saufen. Komm, steh auf, Kasper. Steh doch auf. Du brauchst dich nicht zu schämen, Kasper. Wir sind ja allein. Nur der liebe Gott schaut so. Du brauchst doch keine Angst zu haben. Mutter! Die Haut geht ab. After Kasper is lifted gently into his chair at the table by the jailkeeper and his son, He's treated as a human being rather than an object or specimen. The keeper takes Casper's hat, not out of social etiquette, but just so he can eat. Having only ever been accustomed to consuming bread and water, Casper spits out the soup as he spat out the food during his interrogation, but he doesn't know that it's food. Thus, that's why he spits it. Note the importance of gestures here, recalling the way the boy sometimes communicated, say, with the Aborigine in Walkabout. Instead of just speaking the cast as the captor had, the boy and his uh, father here demonstrate words through gestures and with objects. They show Casper how to eat using plates and forks, and they show what the word empty means by holding a cup upside down. This is the first time that Casper has been able to identify words with the things and concepts they represent, and he responds with a glimmering understanding. But the word empty, that is uh, central in this scene, isn't coincidental. Even as Casper grasps its meaning, Herzog is commenting, commenting, I think, in that word on the ultimate emptiness that Casper will find in language as a whole. He's more adept at word identification than the Aborigine and walkabout, but the bailiff's son, then again, is a much more patient teacher. He helps Casper name the parts of his body by touching his arm or his hand as he pronounces each word. Later, when a little girl tries to teach Casper a lilting rhyme about a cat lapping milk, Casper can't grasp it because there is no cat there and there is no milk to see or to touch. The words come so quickly in that rhyme that they seem to him just sound. The member of the family who intuitively understands Casper best is the mother. She senses that he can eat only bread and thus offers it to him. Shown rocking her infant in a cradle in the scene, she embodies a maternal principle that Casper had envisioned in his opening dream, that dream of origins. He associates motherhood with the disembodied state of being that he longs to return to, a kind of spiritual womb, if you will. Well, the images of innocence that we see in the family's kitchen reflect Casper's own unique situation as an innocent. First, like the infant, Casper is still at a mental age too young to recognize himself in the mirror when the boy, after this, holds it up before Casper's eyes. Now, the French psychoanalytic theorist Jacques Lacan describes the mirror stage in development as the moment of self-discovery that occurs sometime after a baby is six months old when the baby is able to recognize itself as having a bodily existence separate and distinct from the world around it. Casper's blank look into the mirror indicates that he isn't quite there yet in a mental sense. 
Later, when he's being bathed for the first time, Casper is unable even again to distinguish the limits of his body. He says, mother, my skin is coming off when he sees the dirt being rinsed. Again, mother. By mother, Casper isn't referring to the woman who is bathing him per se, but rather, I think, to some nurturing, protective, originary figure glimpsed in his dream that he conceives of as his mother, spiritual mother. Herzog also shows a crucifix on the wall here, which reinforces Casper's kinship with the crucified Christ as an innocent sacrifice. Like the incarnated Christ, Casper's birth into the material world from a spiritual domain is a fall into suffering and into mortality. And like Christ, Casper is not only innocent, but inherently compassionate. In his jail cell, he feeds a bird using a twig and laughs happily when he sees it eating. Now, at this point, he's begun to understand that the creature is separate from himself. But like him, it needs food, and Casper understands this. Casper's capacity for compassion seems innate, inborn. But the idea that the bird needs food and Casper's use of a twig are things that are really ideas uh, that he has acquired through observation. He knows how to feed it only by observing and learning. Well, much of Casper's early education is a meditation on learning, and as such, it engages enlightenment theories of perception and the acquisition of knowledge, the field of philosophy known as epistemology. And in particular, Herzog invokes the work of John Locke, who famously argued that every human being is born a tabula rasa, that is, we are born blank slates. We bring no innate ideas into the world. It is only through the experience of our senses that we form ideas about the world through a process of observation and association. In this respect, consider Casper's response to the burning candle that the town folk present to him in a scientific trial by fire, scrupulously recording his reactions. Have a look. Mutter, ich bin von allem abgetan. Casper didn't react when an officer feigned a sword thrust at him. He'd never seen a sword before, so he had no idea of the inborn danger there. And similarly, Casper doesn't understand that fire can burn him. Having spent so long in the dark, Casper's drawn to the light of the flame, following it with his eyes, and he's so curious that he touches it with his finger and feels pain. Now, in Locke's terms, Casper associates the flame at this moment with the pain in his finger and forms the idea that fire burns. In a moment later, though, we see him weeping in a medium shot, not a close-up, which Herzog uses fairly rarely, but a medium shot. This is the first of three scenes in which Casper is shown crying. His tears here, however, aren't simply a response to the pain of being burned. He also weeps at the wonder of his discovery. After all, Casper has been beaten by his keeper before this. He certainly suffered more intense pain than a burned finger. No, it's more than just pain. He'd remained completely, seemingly indifferent to the earlier abuse, but this, this pain is new and wondrous. His tears mark moments in his life, as we'll see, of overwhelming discovery. He weeps again when he holds the baby of the jailkeeper's wife, when she places it in his arms. She understands more than anyone 
that Casper's natural inclination is to protect the child. Before she enters the room, Casper touches the infant in its crib using the same finger he had put into the flame. He's trying to map the world, not just with his eyes, but tactilely, trying to affirm the existence of independent realities. Casper's tears as he holds the baby suggest complex possibilities. They're partly an expression of a kind of instinctive love for the infant, and partly the luminous discovery of what this warm, independent human reality feels like and smells like. But his cryptic remark, Mother, I am so far from everything, suggests another reason for his tears at this moment. What does he mean by everything? Well, Casper is far away from the life that he knew chained in the cellar, but the word mother and everything point far beyond that. Casper sees that the baby's mother loves it, and this seems to awaken his own memory of a maternal presence. It could refer, perhaps, to his own early infancy before abduction, but again, I think it's more likely that everything refers, particularly in the context of motherhood, to a state of existence prior to birth, for which Casper can find no other words other than everything and references to mother. To be in that world at all would be preferable. Um, to be in that world, in that dream state of prenatal contentment, would be a far preferable alternative to the world he is in. Well, even as Casper is curious to learn about the world he is in, the baby is a reminder of his own fall into mortal life, thus the tears. This fall is that other cause for weeping, particularly given the malignity he so often sees in his fellow man. Casper's very innocence seems to bring out cruelty in others, as when the local pranksters tease him by hypnotizing a rooster so that it seems dead and then revive it. Well, before this revival, uh, Casper hadn't responded to the rooster at all. But when it lies down, he just assumed it was dead. It's only when the bird gets up, challenging Casper's acquired ideas, that he is so terrified that he tries to climb out the jail window. Far crueler than this prank is the town's subsequent exploitation of Casper, whose upkeep in the jail they regard as a financial burden. Although it's rumored that he's the heir to the Duke's throne, his features are judged to be too crude for such aristocratic heritage. The other theory, that he escaped from a traveling circus, prompts their money-making scheme. The authorities lease him to a carnival showman, a charlatan who exhibits Casper, along with a performing bear, a flute-playing Peruvian Indian, a fire eater, a boy in a trance, and a dwarf king. Have a look. Seine Herkunft ist nach wie vor unbekannt. Ist er ein Prinz? Oder stammt er sogar von Napoleon ab? Er ist und bleibt das Rätsel Europas. Like the tiny king and like the camels, Casper is exhibited as an exotic freak. He's presented as one of the wonders of Europe that the crowd pays to see. He's made to reenact the scene in which he was first discovered. 
As in his other films, Herzog shows the isolating nature of difference and satirizes societies that both fetishize and punish individuals who don't conform anatomically or psychologically to the prevailing model. Casper's body and mind um, are exploited here, but also his innocence. And in this respect, he resembles David Merrick, the elephant man in David Lynch's excellent film. Well, during the exhibition, we see a wealthy man in the background. It is Herr Dahmer. Uh, he's watching Casper. He takes pity on him, rescues Casper, and becomes Casper's second father figure. But this occurs only after Casper, along with the Indian, try to escape from the carnival. In one of Herzog's long still shots, we see Casper gazing into the cage of an animal. We don't see the animal itself, only the bars and Casper's gaze. Clearly, Casper sees his own confinement in the image of the imprisoned animal and wants his freedom. Now, Casper didn't protest either in the cellar or in the jail, but he finds this form of entrapment, this objectification before the eyes of the world, unendurable because it is so cruel. A cut brings us to a field where the custodians of civic order are chasing Casper and ordering him to stop in the name of the law. The law is the essence of patriarchy. It's not just civil law, but also the law of reason, the law of social conformity that make Casper an outcast. There's also the law of bureaucratic officialdom that the little man invokes when he says that Casper's attempt at escape will make a beautiful report. Having never lived in nature, the escaped Casper has no survival skills. When he's found, he says, I need to fly. <laughs> he can't do that. As he sits in his shed, he says, I want to fly like a rider midst the bloody tussle of war. Now, this seems to be an interesting variation on the line that he learned about wanting to be a rider like his father. But now Casper, with some understanding, applies these words to his own situation and changes them. His life is a bloody tussle from which he would like to fly away like a bird. A cut brings us to the house of the wealthy man uh, who has rescued other out misfits Dahmer has. Two years have now passed and Casper has acquired enough language to converse, but he uses words most often to express the confusion and pain he feels at his accelerated immersion into the world. Have a look. Kasper, was ist? Hast du was? Es fühlt mich stark in der Brust. Die Musik fühlt mich stark in der Brust. Ich bin so unversehens alt. Aber Kasper, du bist doch erst so kurz auf der Welt. Du hast doch alles noch vor dir. Warum ist mir alles so schwer? Warum kann man das Klavier nicht spielen, so wie das Atmen? Sieh mal an, Kasper. In den zwei Jahren, seit ich dich bei mir aufgenommen habe, hast du so viel gelernt. Du musst eben jetzt in deinem Alter alles nachholen, weil du früher nicht unter Menschen warst. Die Menschen sind mir wie die Wölfe. So kann man das nicht sagen. Sieh dir doch den jungen Herrn Florian an, der über uns wohnt. Seitdem seine ganze Familie bei dem Unglück umgekommen ist, ist er blind und er beklagt sich auch nicht. Er spielt den ganzen Tag Klavier, wenn noch ein bisschen anders, als das heute schicklich ist. Das ist aber hoch. Das muss ein großer Mann gewesen sein der das gebaut hat. Den möchte ich gerne kennenlernen. <lacht> Nein, Kaspar, ein Baumeister braucht nicht so groß sein wie ein Turm. Da gibt es Gerüste. Da führe ich dich heute noch zu einer Baustelle hin. In diesem Turm, hinter diesem Fensterchen dort hast du gewohnt. Erinnerst du dich noch? Das ist nicht möglich. Wie meinst du das? Weil der Raum nur ein paar Schritte groß ist. Verstehe ich immer noch nicht. 
Wenn ich mich in dem Raum umsehe, dann ist rechts und links, vor und rückwärts nur Raum. Sehe ich mich aber den Turm an. Mich, mir, mir. Und ich drehe mich um. Dann ist der Turm weg. Also ist der Raum größer wie der Turm. Casper's tears as he listens to a blind man play a strange piece of music that he composed are again complex in nature. Casper is deeply moved by these sounds and by the beauty in nature that recalls his dreams. Um, his natural affinity with the beautiful, whether it is in nature or in art, uh, might recall to you the creature in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, another individual uh, innocently born into the world uh, as an adult and victimized. Note that Shelley's novel is also set in Germany in the 1820s, but there's this crucial difference between Casper and Shelley's creature. When her creature is corrupted by the cruelty and abandonment of Victor, um, he turns to violence in a way that Casper never does. But Casper is frustrated by the world, and when he asks his patron why he can't play the piano as effortlessly as he breathes, we realize that Casper at this moment is also crying for another reason. It's because he's frustrated at the demands that life places on him. The demands, so it seems to him, to learn everything in just a few years that take other individuals decades. Casper's efforts to acquire knowledge have been so exhausting that they have also skewed his sense of time. When he tells the patron, I feel so unexpectedly old, he means the absorption of so much new information so quickly has made the weeks and months in his life pass to feel as if they were years. Casper struggles to adopt this subjective inner sense of time to the clock-driven world of society. And even more, he struggles to understand spatial relations. We see this in his fascinating commentary on the tower. Here Herzog alludes to the work of the Enlightenment philosopher as both Descartes and Locke. In his meditations, Descartes asks that when we see a tower and turn away, how do we know it's still there when we aren't looking at it? Well, what assurance, he asks, do we have that objects exist outside of our subjective register? Casper asks this question, but he's also puzzled by the size and spatial relations of the tower. The tower where he lives is vast and high, yet he can make it disappear, he says, just by turning his back. His room in the tower is just a few paces across, yet when he's in it, he can't make it disappear. Therefore, Casper thinks that the room in the tower must be larger than the tower itself. How can this be? Well, Casper doesn't understand that he sees the two from different distances and that their sizes change relatively with his perspective. In his essay on human understanding, Locke explains that our ability to understand um, how the size of objects changes with our visual distance from them is something that we acquire over time until it becomes a perceptual habit that we bring to bear on the world. But Casper's experiences are so new and so overwhelming that he hasn't yet formed this perceptual habit. Instead, he asks the searching questions central to the branch of philosophy known as epistemology. But he also raises ethical and theological questions about mankind and God. Having known mostly cruelty from men before his rescue, uh, and certainly before uh, his, his patron took him, uh, Casper says at one point that people are like wolves to me. But now, with Dahmer, he asks, why is everyone so kind to me? He's really pondering the mystery of human nature. How can human beings be both cruel and kind? Well, like the scientific community, the local clergy take a keen interest in Casper, but they're disarmed at what they discover. Have a look. Casper, was uns am meisten interessiert, ist, ob du nicht so etwas wie eine natürliche Gottesidee empfunden hast, ob du in deiner Gefangenschaft nicht an etwas Höheres gedacht hast. Ich verstehe diese Frage nicht. In meinem Gefängnis habe ich an gar nichts gedacht. Und ich kann mir es nicht vorstellen, dass Gott aus nichts alles erschaffen hat, 
so wie Sie es mir gesagt haben. Frau Meta, er versteht unsere Frau nicht. Er versteht das, er versteht das nicht. Dann muss er eben glauben. Du musst eben glauben. Das genaue Nachforschen nach dunklen Gegenständen des Glaubens ist Unrecht. Ich muss es besser lesen und schreiben lernen, um das andere zu verstehen. Nein, Kaspar, diese Dinge, die Dinge des Glaubens sind wichtiger. Und dann musst du dir abgewöhnen, beim Sprechen immer so Daumen und Zeigefinger zusammenzupressen. Nun sprich mir mal wenigstens ein Gebet nach, mein Sohn. Sprich nach. Und der Friede Gottes, welcher höher ist denn alle menschliche Vernunft, bewahre unsere Herzen in Christo Jesu. Amen. Sprich das nach. Sprich. Just before his interrogation, the kindly maid had told the clerics not to torture Casper, again linking maternal fe females uh, to his sense of protective well-being. When asked if he thought of God in his captivity, the clerics really want to know if the idea of God is innate in man or is acquired. Now, of course, they would like Casper to confirm that a sense of God is innate, that it's inborn, because if God is just an idea, then how can one truly believe in him? Well, Casper disappoints them by saying that in his captivity he thought of nothing back then and certainly not of God, but he goes even further. Based on the knowledge he's acquired in the world, Casper can't affirm the existence of a God who made everything out of nothing. That concept of something out of nothing goes against what he sees in material reality and against the rudiments of reasons that he's the reason he's learned. Well, ironically then, having had rationalism drummed into him, Casper now turns it against the social order that preaches it and exposes the gap between reason and Christian belief. When the visitors stridently insist that Casper must have faith and recite a prayer to demonstrate it, Casper silently refuses. Now, there are two ironies here. First, in his compassionate innocence, Casper is much closer to Christ than the ministers who question him and find him wanting. And second, in his dreams, Casper envisions a spiritual state of being that these men can only theorize about. Despite this intuitive numinous knowledge, however, Casper can only form judgments about the material world based on what his senses have taught him thus far in it. This reliance sometimes causes him to misread causes and effects. For example, he assumes that because apples are living things, they have volition and feelings just like he does. When his patron tells him that they don't, he demonstrates by showing him that you can roll an apple and make it stop with your foot. Well, when it hits a bump and flies over the man's foot, which was meant to stop it, Casper sees that as not an accident, but a confirmation of his belief that apples indeed have a will of their own. Earlier, based on his own learning to walk on two legs, Casper assumes that the cat in the jail cell can do this also and tries to show it. But one of the wonderful things about Casper's questions is that they expose the inequities and the hypocrisies of the society that he has entered. For example, over tea with Mr. Dahmer's housekeeper, he asks, what are women good for? noting that they seem just to sit around and knit. He doesn't mean it as a criticism. It's a genuine inquiry based on his observations, but it highlights the reduction of women to passive roles within patriarchy. Casper's questions are often profound and penetrating because they raise issues also that are at the heart of moral philosophy. What perplexes him most, as I've suggested, is the presence of evil in the world. Have a look. For Tagi hatte ich vom Garten Kress meinen Namen gesät. Und dieser war recht schön kommen und hat mir eine solche Freude gemacht, dass ich es gar nicht sagen kann. Und gestern, wie ich vom Kahnfahren kommen, da ist einer in den Garten herein und hat mir meinen Namen zertreten. Da habe ich lange geweint und das Beet will ich aufs Neue sehen.
mich hat geträumt. Du hast geträumt? Was denn? Erzähl du. Ja, es hat mich geträumt. Ich freue mich, dass du Fortschritte gemacht hast. Früher hast du immer geglaubt, alles sei Wirklichkeit, was du geträumt hast. Noch vor zwei Wochen hast du gesagt, du hättest die Frau Bürgermeister gesehen, wo sie erwiesenermaßen schon längst verreist war. Merkwürdig. Merkwürdig, dass du die ganzen Jahre im Gefängnis nichts geträumt hast. Mich hat vom Kaukasus geträumt. Kasper, das kann doch nicht so sein, wie du sagst, dass nur dein Bett das einzig Angenehme für dich ist auf der Welt und alles andere gar schlecht. Fällt dir denn der Garten nicht? Die Stachelbeeren? Und da, da die Zwiebeln sind so grün. Ja! Mir kommt es vor, dass mein Erscheinen auf dieser Welt ein harter Sturz gewesen ist. Even though Casper can speak and write, he struggles to find words to express his confusion. Here he tries to formulate these doubts in a letter, choosing each word carefully to express that confusion about human conduct. Why? Well, he sowed crest seeds <coughs> to spell out his name. His only pleasure in language is when it is embodied in nature, not merely abstract symbols or sounds. Well, seeing his name materialize in the natural world, in that crest, gave Casper a brief sense of self-recognition that was missing, for example, when he looked in the mirror two years earlier. He describes his joy at achieving this, but then he describes the pain he felt when someone deliberately destroyed his work. The question he's laboring to formulate in this letter is why people are so gratuitously cruel. Not all, but some. Casper plans to plant the cress again, but the unanswered question that hangs over his confusion is why God created beings who would behave this way. This cruelty, which Casper has known primarily since his birth, is one reason why he tells Dahmer that the only time he's really happy is when he is in bed. Sleep temporarily relieves him of the sight of the world's brutality, and it puts Casper, as I've noted, in touch with the dreams of a prior state of existence. When Dahmer took Casper boating on the moonlit river, which Herzog presents to the sounds of Beethoven, um, we're reminded there, in the serenity of that scene, of that other world and that other river that Casper glimpsed at the beginning of the film in a dream. The first dream images, remember, were of a river and a boat. Other landscapes that Casper sees and hears uh, about also summon these prenatal memories as Casper tries to describe them. When, for example, he hears about the Sahara Desert, he says it gives him the idea for a story, perhaps one related to his prior existence. Casper goes further, though, when he says, when he learns about the Caucasus Mountains. He dreams about them 
and describes that dream to Dahmer. The way he phrases it is important. It dreamed to me. This isn't just a mis <coughs> grammatical misstatement. The various landscapes that Casper sees in his dreams seem to arise from some collective psychic or spiritual wellspring of which his own unconscious mind and memory are only a part. Thus, it seems something larger is dreaming through him. Uh, the entire soul of mankind seems to be dreaming through Casper, revealing to him in a series of symbolic images the most ancient residue of uh, man's collective human experience, that is, the memory of another numinous state of being that we all experienced before we were born. Now, while everyone is connected to this collective soul, to this racial memory, only Casper is in touch with it closely enough to see its contents in <coughs> his dreams. In that state where Carl Jung suggests the collective unconscious manifests itself most vividly, always and only for Jung in dreams. Well, Dahmer assumes that Casper's dreams arise from socialization, that he had no dreams at all before. But Casper doesn't confirm that claim. And indeed, the film suggests that the dream images in Casper's mind arise from a precognitive and prelinguistic sort. Socialization has nothing to do with them. Casper wants to re-enter his dreamscape. He wants never to awaken from it. As he speaks, we see him gazing off in an extended still shot that is a hallmark of what Schrader calls transcendental style. Casper's yearning for this dream landscape prompts his most important remark in the film. Quote, well, it seems to me that my coming into this world was a terribly hard fall. He chooses each word with care as he compares his experience in the material world and what he has glimpsed in it to the world of his visions. It can only be a declension, only a fall. Now, during part of this conversation, Herzog focuses on a stork, a symbol of birth, that entry into the world that Casper regards as a fall. Without knowing it, Casper is invoking an ancient tradition of mystical Jewish thought in his commentary here, a tradition called Gnosticism. According to the Gnostics, man didn't fall when he sinned against God, as the book of Genesis claims. Rather, the original fall uh, was the act of creation itself, material creation, in which an original spiritual being became stuck in and contaminated by the world of matter. The human race is born out of this fall, and the acquisition of consciousness and language are subsequent falls or declines in man's tragic trajectory. Casper is living it out. Casper has experienced all of these falls, and he wants to leave this thrice-fallen world behind. Herzog presents the dream images that Casper describes in the Caucasus as flickering, um, uh, as if uh, the desert and the domes and the minarets that we see is being projected in a kind of sepia tone uh, by an early piece of film machinery. Herzog's self-reflexive gesture here reminds us of the close connection between film and dreaming that Jean-Louis Baudre describes in a segment of his influential study that I assigned you to read with his film. Drawing on Freud's groundbreaking interpretation of dreams and the subsequent work of Bertram Lewin, Baudre links dreaming and cinema viewing in three ways that enrich our understanding both of Casper's visions and of Herzog's technique of presenting them. First, Baudre notes that both dreaming and cinema create an illusion of reality. The sleeper is enclosed in his dream and the moviegoer is so immersed in the screen illusion that he suspends disbelief. Both cases present moments in which we believe what we see is real. As Baudry puts it, the dream and the film pass themselves off as reality. Unless, of course, the dreamer disavows the illusions in the dream by reminding himself within the dream that he's only dreaming, and unless the filmmaker reminds the viewer that we are watching an engineered illusion. Second, Baudre describes both dreaming and film viewing as alike, as forms of regression in which we return to a previous state of hallucinatory satisfaction. In Casper's case, it's a prior condition of mystical disembodied existence, but Baudre suggests that a film viewer also reverts to a regressive state under the artificial stimulus of the projected images. 
like Casper, we're like an infant, he says, we lose a sense of boundaries between our bodies uh, and what is outside them because we're so thoroughly immersed in the dreamlike world we see on the screen. But unlike Casper, what we see is merely an illusion. It's not a memory of a previous actual state of being. Finally, Baudre links dreaming and film spectatorship through the shared principle of projection. When we dream, our minds function like uh, cinema projectors, he suggests, or like the producers of the shadows in Plato's cave. Our mind is the dream screen on which these images are cast. Well, Herzog's deliberate styling of Casper's dream of the Caucasus uh, as an early uh, projection uh, of cinematic images in some old flickering device calls attention, I think, to that similarity between dream projection and cinema projection. Uh, he cleverly links the flickering tinted images of uh, an early cinematic uh, uh, style of projection with the ancient sources in human consciousness that give rise to Casper's dreams. These visions are a way of accessing metaphysical truth for Casper that has nothing to do with what he has been taught or learned in society. Well, just as he can turn reason against his teachers, Casper can also reveal the narrow limits of reason itself, as when the logic professor comes to test him. He presents a highly complex conundrum in which a single question is necessary to distinguish a man from a village of truth-tellers from a man who comes from a village of liars. Casper suggests an alternative that is more direct but no less effective. Instead of asking what village the man is from, ask him if he's a tree frog. Only a man from the liar's village will answer yes. The logic master is so angered by this answer that he dismisses it and insists that, quote, understanding is less important than reasoning. In short, truth matters less than systems employed to find it. How could Casper possibly respect logic after this encounter? His distrust of reason and Herzog's are very much in the spirit of German and English romanticism. One thinks, for example, of William Blake's indictment of unfettered reason as a life-denying force that strangles the imagination. As Blake puts it, we murder to dissect. And the rational society of Herzog's film tries to dissect Casper's mind and body in every possible way. Well, despite Casper's sense of the inadequacy of language, he tries to use words to write an autobiography, to tell his own story. He's writing this for others, but primarily in an attempt at self-comprehension. But how can you write with authority about your life when you're still learning it and it's been moving so fast? Casper struggles, therefore, and this may be why he wants to express himself increasingly through music. When he first heard it played, he said the words were strong in my heart. Now, the historical Casper Hauser actually did compose strange musical pieces, but Herzog's Casper tries and fails to perform a piano piece by Mozart. It occurs in a salon where he's about to be adopted by the protege of, by, as protege by the foppish Lord Stanhope. This is yet another father figure, and a much less benign one than his aging guardian Dahmer. Have a look. Did ich dem Herrn Bürgermeister vorstellen und seiner Gemahl. Guten Tag, Kaspar. Ich freue mich, dass ich Sie auch kennenlerne, Kaspar. Sagen Sie uns doch, wie war es denn in Ihrem Gefängnis, in diesem dunklen Kellerloch? Besser wie draußen. Aber es geht dir doch sehr gut hier, Kaspar, und alle haben dich gern. Kaspar, wolltest du etwas sagen? Du brauchst nicht vor den Anwesenden zu erschrecken. Du kannst in deiner ganzen jungen Natürlichkeit ausdrücken, was dich bewegt. Eure Herrlichkeit, an mir ist minder nichts, das lebt als mein Leben. Aber Kaspar, es lebt doch viel mehr in dir. Du hast so schöne Fortschritte in der Musik gemacht. Und das ist doch etwas, das jeden Menschen sittlich ergreift, bildet und veredelt. Eure Herrlichkeit, ich möchte gerne auf dem Klaviere etwas durchgeben. Ich spiele den Mozart Walzer in F-Dur.
Of Casper's many prisons, this is the most oppressive. Stanhope is worse than the carnival barker even because he wants not just to exhibit Casper as a curiosity, but to show his social set how he has tamed this supposed noble savage. He tries to inflict rigid manners on Casper, uh, with his uh, who that Casper, with his craving for authenticity, finds unbearably false. When the mayor's wife asks Casper about his time in the cellar, Casper says he preferred that state to being outside where he is now, because at least in the cellar, his pain was physical rather than mental. The only thing that lives in me, he says, is my life. He means that while his body continues to breathe, he feels emotionally dead within. Well, as an English dilettante, Stanhope is also, of course, a closeted gay man. His description of his trip to the land of Greek love is a coded hint of that and Herzog insinuates that Stanhope may intend for Casper to become his lover. Unable to finish at the piano, Casper flees the scene. He's developed an existential dread of confinement, be it physical, social, ideological, or linguistic, all of which seem to him more painful versions of his original captivity. Thus, for the first and only time, he actively rebels. It's not just against Stanhope, who casts him off when Casper removes his shirt, but against civilization and learning at large. In the next scene, Casper runs out of the church, telling Dahmer that the singing of the choir and the sermon now seem to him mere howling. Organized religion seems to Casper another lie, mere artifice. He loves music, but he dislikes the inauthenticity of religious doctrine. Although Casper has never lived in nature, he tries to counter this falsity he finds in the church by embracing nature now as he flees. So he runs into a privy and begins to eat a stork egg when unexpectedly his original captor appears outside. Have a look. Now, why, having unburdened himself of Casper over two years earlier, is this man in black now determined to kill him with a violent blow? It's one of the film's mysteries, among many. Perhaps Casper's ability to read and write make the man afraid that he will remember and describe that man to the authorities. Well, as Casper lies bleeding, he feels himself escaping into the misty dreamscape we saw at the start of the film. It seems to beckon him. He wants to go there. Dahmer and his housekeeper follow a trail of blood through the house in the yard where Casper has wandered, and they find him collapsed in the cellar. It's as if Casper has chosen that place so that he can die before he's found. It's also a return to his origins, a dark, womb-like version of his original captivity, as a preparation for a return to his place of spiritual oneness and contentment before birth. As he lies in bed recovering, however, unwillingly, Casper tells Dahmer of another vision that came to him while he was lay bleeding, a vision of a different kind. Have a look. Is <laughs> Thank you. 
da habe ich das Meer gesehen. Ich habe einen Berg gesehen und viele Menschen, die sind auf dem Berg aufgestiegen, wie in einer Prozession. Da war viel Nebel. Ich konnte es nicht ganz klar sehen. Und oben, da war der Tod. describes and Herzog presents isn't a dream of life before uh, his entry into the world, um, but rather uh, a dream that is really an allegory of Casper's own life in the world as he has experienced it. Casper now understands it with great clarity, not in words but in images. The setting is not a green pastoral landscape as in his uh, prenatal dreams, but a landscape of barren rock. And the dream reveals to Casper that his life, and all human life, is an arduous toiling toward death, which lies in this allegory at the mountaintop. The flickering images recall the dance of death, yet the rhythms of Pachelbel's canon, which we hear again now, suggest that this dream didn't oppress Casper, because what the climbers find at the top of the mountain, death, is release, longed for release. It's a return to that other part of the symbolic landscape that Casper mentions, but that we don't see the boundless ocean. Now, since he learned to think, Casper has pondered the purpose of his life. Now he knows the purpose of it. It is to reach death and escape the burden of mortal existence. That's the point. Casper craves this release more than ever now, as the next scene suggests. He looks into a barrel of water and sees his reflection, this time with clear self-recognition. His response, though, is to disrupt the watery image. It's a gesture of self-erasure. The reflection is the marker of his body, his physical existence in the mortal world, circumscribed and confined like the water is confined within the barrel. Well, the water that Casper longs for is the visionary river of his dreams. He doesn't have to wait very long, as he is soon attacked again, in the same season when the captor left him in town three years earlier. The circumstances of Casper's death are mystifying and paradoxical. His first captor seems driven by a paranoid dread of exposure, and so he kills the innocent man he abused for 16 years, having failed to kill him the first time. But why is the man in black so afraid? Why does he explain in a note this motive that amounts to a half confession? Because he's also tortured by guilt, it seems, but not tortured enough to reveal himself or name himself openly. Instead, he gives his initials, M-L-O, rather than his name, as if this will be enough to ease his conscience. But how can it diminish the man's guilt when he is murdering the man who is the source of that guilt to begin with? Does he hope irrationally that by removing Casper uh, from the world, he will also make his guilt disappear? Well, we never know, and the authorities never discover who the man is, um, and um, that seems suggested by Herzog's shot of the empty grove of trees at the end of the scene where the man has left and fled. We don't see him and they never will. Herzog presents Casper's deathbed in a long shot. When a cleric asks if he has anything to unburden before he dies, Casper describes a final dream, but he doesn't know the ending. Have a look. Die Karawane hält jetzt an, weil einige glauben, Sie hätten sich verirrt. 
weil sie Berge vor sich sehen. Sie messen mit dem Kompass und wissen nicht weiter. Da nimmt der blinde Führer eine Hand voll Sand und schmeckt ihn ab wie ein Essen. Sohn, sagt der Blinde, ihr irrt euch, das vor uns sind gar keine Berge. Es ist nur eure Einbildung. Wir ziehen weiter nach Norden. Ja, und dann ziehen sie ohne Widerspruch weiter und sie erreichen die Stadt im Norden. Und da spielt die Geschichte. Aber die eigentliche Geschichte in dieser Stadt weiß ich nicht. A Berber caravan is riding on camels through a desert and they fear they're lost. They consult their compasses but remain uncertain. Only an old blind man knows the direction of the city they're seeking. He tastes the sand and tells them the mountains they see are an illusion and they must continue straight ahead. And they do. And they reach the city, which is where Casper says the story really begins as his own life story is ending. Well, if the dream of climbing the mountain was Casper's allegory of life struggling toward liberation in death, he's nearly there now. But this desert dream is also an allegory of Casper's life in a way. He is the blind man, wise beyond his limitations, one who understands things that rationalism and the rationalism in this dream of the compass cannot fathom. But there's this twist. The travelers follow the blind man, while Casper's wisdom in life is misunderstood, mocked, and discredited. He hasn't led anyone to the city, so he can't tell the story that he says would begin there. Instead, as another blind man, the pianist hums a tune, Casper dies, only to have his body anatomized the way his mind has been. Have a look. Und er streckt sich bis unter die linke Zwerchfellkuppel. Herr Schaffierich, glauben Sie, haben Sie das? Bis unter die linke Zwerchfellkuppel. Schauen Sie sich das Gehirn an. Es ist etwas Besonderes daran. In der Tat, eine merkwürdige Abnormität im Sinne einer Überentwicklung des Kleinhirns. Ganz meine Meinung. Andererseits besteht auch eine Deformität des Großhirns. Die linke Hemisphäre ist verkleinert. Das erklärt diesen, vielleicht vieles. Auch diesen Befund sollten wir festhalten. Zeigen Sie bitte, Abnormität des Kleinhirns im Sinne einer Überentwicklung. Eine Überentwicklung? Deformität. Deformität? Der linken Großhirnhemisphäre. Das, dass das Kleinhirn nicht zurecht bedeckt wird. Dass das Kleinhirn nicht zurecht bedeckt wird. Kutscher, heute ist ein Tag, den man sich merken wird. Nimm er meinen Hut und fahr er in mir voraus nach Hause. Ich gehe heute zu Fuß. Ein schönes Protokoll, ein genaues Protokoll. Ich werde zu Protokoll geben, dass man an Hause Deformationen entdeckt hat. Wir haben endlich für diesen befremdlichen Menschen eine Erklärung, wie man sie besser nicht finden tun kann. We got a shot of Casper's foot, which we saw at the start, now tagged for an autopsy. It's not just required for the official record, but it's driven by a desperate need to define and classify him, to reduce the mystery of Casper's life and death to scientific causes, to the knowable. Uh, abnormalities of the liver or the cerebellum, something that will account for it. Herzog's satire here is withering as Casper's brain is sliced, cut apart, and we hear the triumphant cries of the little scribe, the embodiment of language and reason and officialdom. It's a day to remember, he says, because the mystery of Casper Hauser has been solved. The dissection has murdered that mystery. 
But juxtaposed with this scene of ghastly objectification is the music we heard at the start of the film in Casper's Transcendent Dream. It's an aria in praise of love from Mozart's The Magic Flute. The music reminds us that Casper has now returned to the realm associated with that music, but also that the burning flame of love that Mozart's song describes is nowhere to be found in the world of men. <laughs> 